Greetings, everyone. I'm Paul Pepys, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center at the University of Oregon. Welcome to this third public lecture in the OHC's annual named lecture series. We will have time for Q&A at the end of the talk. If you have questions at that point, please type your questions into the chat feature of Zoom. I will moderate and ask the questions. We've also enabled the close captioning function of Zoom. You can activate captions using the live transcript option. The talk is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the Oregon Humanities Center's website and YouTube channel. The University of Oregon is located on Kalapuya Ilahi, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. Today, Kalapuya descendants are primarily citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians, and they continue to make important contributions to their communities, to the U of O, to Oregon, and to the world. In following the indigenous protocol of acknowledging the original people of the land we occupy, we also extend our respect to the nine federally recognized indigenous nations of Oregon, the Burns Paiute tribe, the Confederated Tribes of the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Slooslaw Indians, the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, the Coquel Indian Tribe, the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians, and the Klamath Tribes. We, respect, we express our respect to the many more tribes who have ancestral connections to this territory, as well as to all other displaced indigenous people who call Oregon home. The Oregon Humanities Center's theme for 2021-22 is Imagining Futures. The series seeks to re-examine some of today's pivotal social issues to envision a more just and sustainable future for all. As with all OHC-themed lectures, our series seeks to create a space for experts to share their research and knowledge and to foster conversation and understanding. Before I introduce today's speaker, some customary thank yous. First, thanks to the OHC's incomparable staff, Associate Director Gina Turner, Program Coordinator Melissa Gustafson, and Communications Coordinator Peg Gearhart. Second, many thanks to the OHC's generous donors, without whom we could not support the kind of innovative humanities research, teaching, and public programming that we do. And thanks, last but not least, to all of you for joining us this afternoon. I'm now delighted to introduce our speaker, Kimberly Nicholas, Associate Professor of Sustainability Science at Lund University in Sweden and Director of PhD Studies at the Lund University Center for Sustainability Studies. Professor Nicholas will present this year's Cressman Lecture. The Cressman Lecture in the Humanities was inaugurated in 1994 with a generous bequest from former UO anthropology professor and archeologist, Luther Cressman. The inaugural Cressman Lecture was delivered by N. Scott Mamaday in 1996. The lectureship's goal is the presentation and illumination of fundamental humanities issues confronting societies centrally occupied with science technology, and business. Both the Cressman Lectures aims to illuminate fundamental humanities issues confronting societies centrally occupied with science, technology, and business, and our theme of imagining futures help explain why we invited Kimberly Nicholas to be this year's Cressman Lecturer. Kimberly Nicholas is Associate Professor of Sustainability Science at Lund University and Director of PhD Studies at the Lund University Center for Sustainability Studies. In her research, Professor Nicholas studies the connections between people, land, and climate with the goal of stewarding ecosystems to support a good life for everyone alive today and leave a thriving planet for future generations. Professor Nicholas has published over 55 articles on climate and sustainability in leading peer-reviewed journals, writes for publications such as Elle, The Guardian, Scientific American, and New Scientist, and is author of Under the Sky We Make, how to be human in a warming world, as well as the monthly climate newsletter, We Can Fix It. Given Professor Nicholas's experience in publications, her Crestman lecture this afternoon 
facing climate change with facts, feelings, and action, doubtless will not only illuminate fundamental humanities issues confronting our science, technology, and business-oriented society, but also help us imagine a better, safer, and more sustainable future. Please join me in welcoming Kimberly Nicholas. Thank you so much, Paul, and thank you all for having me. It's been such a pleasure to get to know you, to get to know Gina and Peg and Melissa over the last, I think it was eight months ago that we first started this conversation. So I'm really grateful I can be with you here today for you in Oregon tonight for me here in Sweden and share some of my work. Let me share my screen here. There we go. Do you see me well, Paul? The slides come through fine? Perfect. Great. Okay, I'll go ahead and start. Well, thank you all for joining us. I know that we're all dealing with uh, not the January we hoped for, certainly, um, both in terms of the ongoing pandemic and in terms of the ongoing climate crisis. And it's looking like it really has to be us who need to step up uh, in so many ways in these and despite these challenging times. So I hope I can give you some uh, actionable and evidence-based guidance on how we can do that today. I thought I'd start by sharing a little bit about where I come from. This is a picture of where I grew up in the town of Sonoma. It's about an hour north of San Francisco uh, in, in California, even though now I'm far from home in Sweden. And this is a picture of a vineyard that my parents planted when I was about five years old. I ended up studying uh, the wine industry and how climate change was already 15 years ago affecting the wine industry in California, both how the grapes were being affected and how growers and winemakers were adapting to climate change and the limits to adaptation. And that really informs my work still because basically the bottom line of the work that I've done and of countless other colleagues um, and studies in systems around the world, not just wine, but ecosystems and agriculture and human ecological systems around the world, show us very clearly that right now the earth is in big trouble and it is up to us to fix it. We are the make or break generation and this is the make or break decade. And what I mean by life on earth is in big trouble. We know that the changes that humans are making both to the climate and to the fabric of life, to biodiversity, are enormous and very dangerous. We are already living in a world of dangerous climate change. And this has been very difficult for me personally to grapple with in an ongoing way. I think it's hit closest to home in the catastrophic wildfires that my family has dealt with, been evacuated from. I know many of you in Oregon have also faced directly and impacts from smoke uh, and other indirect impacts for yourselves and your neighbors and friends and family. So I know this issue is very close to home. In the case of these massive wildfires in the West, we know that they've gotten about twice as big and the season has gotten much longer due to human caused climate change. So we are already experiencing very, very difficult impacts. And this just brings closer to home how urgent it is to put into place these changes we'll be talking about. So when I say it's up to us to fix it, I'll go through a little more of the science behind that in a minute. But what I mean by fix it is we need to throw everything we've got into limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. We've already warmed the climate a little over one degree, primarily through burning fossil fuels, secondarily through land use change like deforestation. Uh, we have a really big job to do very fast in order to limit the remaining damage that we're able to tolerate for climate change. At the same time, we have to halt biodiversity loss. We have to protect remaining nature, restore nature that's been degraded. And at the same time, and really as part of the same project and woven throughout in this process in the same way, we need to center human well-being. We need to put people at the heart of what we do alongside nature. And I think here the humanities have a lot to teach us, and I'm really grateful to be speaking to that here today. So I'm going to talk today about facts, feelings, and action. The reason I start with facts is that's my scientific training. I think it's important that we have shared understanding of what uh, scientific evidence tells us and what conclusions we can draw from that. But we also know that facts aren't enough. Facts alone don't change hearts and minds. Facts alone don't translate themselves into policies and behavior change and the social changes that we need. But let's start with the facts, make sure we're on the same page. At the most basic level, 
This is all you need to know of climate science. And this summarizes years and decades and even centuries now of rigorous science that has converged on these answers quite a long time ago and now really concluded quite irrefutably that it's warming, it's us, we're sure, it's bad, we can fix it. If you want to look into the evidence and footnotes, I've developed a teaching curriculum around these points. Uh, there's more information on my website. You can, of course, go to the authoritative source of scientific evidence on climate change, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, starting with their summaries for policymakers. So lots more references if you want to dive into the details here, but these are the high level takeaways. And the reason that it's warming is because humans are adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. It will not stop warming until we stop doing that. And in particular, we have to stop adding carbon dioxide, the main greenhouse gas, to the atmosphere. You may be familiar with the term net zero. If to understand what that means, we can picture our atmosphere like a bathtub. The sources of greenhouse gases, is including carbon, uh, for example, our burning fossil fuels for transport and energy, deforestation, those are like the tap releasing water into the bathtub, which is the atmosphere. The level of water in the tub represents the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The edge of the tub represents our carbon budget. That's the amount of carbon that we can burn and stay, with, stay within a given temperature. We now know from recent science how critically important and truly the difference between life and death for many people and places and ecosystems limiting warming to 1.5 is and will be. So if we take our carbon budget as 1.5 degrees, we have about 90 months of current carbon budget left. It is very little time. So the bottom line is there's a lot of carbon being released from burning fossil fuels from agriculture, especially animal agriculture and deforestation. Uh, there's some carbon being taken out of the atmosphere for free from the gifts of nature. So life on land, uh, trees and in the oceans are absorbing about half of the carbon that we add to the atmosphere. But if we're only taking out half of what we put in, the level is rising. And that's why, for example, you may have seen the headlines that even though emissions were down in 2020 due to the pandemic, the total amount of carbon in the atmosphere was still rising. So basically what happened then was the tap got a little bit closed and that slowed the rate of how fast the water in the tub is rising. But to stabilize temperature, to stabilize, requires we stabilize CO2. To stabilize CO2 requires we completely shut off the tap and entirely stop adding carbon to the atmosphere. We've put this job off for a very long time and there's very little time left to do it. And that means we have to act really fast. I find this graph really <laughs> um, depressing, to be honest, because what it shows is that the science was clear enough to act on 20 years ago. If we had started then, we would be on this curve and we would have a much longer time to make much more gradual changes in order to stay within our carbon budget. But we didn't, and we can talk about why that's the case and, and what delayed us. There have been, unfortunately, um, misinformation campaigns and other um, political delays that have really put us far behind where we should be. But the point that we find ourselves at now is the top of this peak here. And you can see it is a very steep line that we need to follow if we actually want to make this budget and limit warming to 1.5 degrees. We need to reduce in rich countries like the US and Sweden. We should be reducing emissions around 10% a year or more. That is a really big job. You can see that there has been progress. So things have been going in the right direction but too slowly. So um, before the Paris Agreement, this 2015 international agreement by all the governments and countries of the world to limit warming and uh, avoid the worst impacts to help poor countries adapt, to avoid changes we can't manage, we were headed for something like four to five degrees of warming. And that has been improving through existing policies uh, and actions. The latest estimate is we're headed for somewhere just below three degrees of warming. That's much better than four or five because we know that every fraction of a degree really matters. It really makes a difference for 
where and how and which crops we can grow, what those crop yields will be like, what life is possible really for people and the 8 million species that we share this planet with. So it is a big step forward, but it is not enough. What you see here is called the ambition gap. And this is basically the gap between where we are headed with current policies and where we need to be to be on track to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. And you see it's a big gap. So basically we, because we've used up almost all of our carbon budget, we just have this small amount remaining and this very short window of time in which to do it. If we don't cut greenhouse gases about in half in the next 90 months, we will have missed our window to limit warming to 1.5. It will not be possible to do that anymore. So we are extremely important to life on earth, both for the rest of our lifetime and really for the rest of human civilization because carbon essentially lasts forever. Carbon in the atmosphere, some of it lasts for 10,000 years. That's about twice as long as Stonehenge or the Great Pyramids have been on Earth. So our carbon legacy is one of the most important ways that we are shaping the world for ourselves and for hundreds, really, of future generations. So we know what we have to do. We know how to solve climate change. It's simple, but not easy. We have to stop digging up and burning carbon-based fuels as our energy source. Right now, the vast majority of energy for transport, for electricity and heating come from burning fossil fuels like coal, oil, and gas. So we're taking essentially this stored energy that plants in ancient swamps 400 million years ago turned from the sun into their bodies by photosynthesis. They got buried and through time and, and pressure were turned into these energy rich fossil fuels. And most of our energy today comes from digging them up and burning them. We have to stop doing that really, really fast to stop global warming. And that means we have to stop both producing and consuming fossil fuels. This whole chain has to be redirected to renewable and sustainable energy sources. So you may have heard the statistic that it's only 100 companies that are responsible for more than 70% of industrial greenhouse gas emissions. Those would be these big uh, energy and fossil fuel companies like you see on the left down here, Shell, Exxon, Chevron, BP, et cetera. That's true. But you might also have heard, or maybe you haven't heard, that it's only 10% of consumers that are responsible for over 50%, about 50% of household emissions. And in total, more than 70% of total emissions come from households. So if you think about it, you might say, well, wait a minute, how, that adds up to more than 70%. How is it possible that these 100 producers cause 70%, but households also cause 70% and just 10% of us in households making over $28,000 a year or more, uh, which is quite many of, of us, I imagine, on this call, uh, if you're not a student, then um, that's you know well below the median income in the US. So how is that possible? If you look at this graph, you get a sense that, okay, this whole chain uh, has to shift. So we have to shift production and we have to shift consumption. We have to do it in smart and fair ways, uh, but we have to do it really quickly. The second thing we have to do to solve climate change, the first is leave fossil fuels in the ground. The second is to stop destroying nature like our lives depend on it, because they really do. Healthy, intact, functional ecosystems are our life support system. We, without them, we don't have food, we don't have water, we don't have clean air. Even the most technologically advanced efforts by humans are not capable of producing these things that we need for our day-to-day -day survival at anything like the scale that we need. So we are utterly reliant on nature. And we're also, I think, morally obligated to protect and conserve and take care of nature in a responsible way. Um, the life on earth deserves to live and I think it's wrong to kill it off. So I propose a way of thinking about our current climate and ecological crisis that is based on a model of exploitation. What I see as the root cause of these two crises and, and contributing to many other 
crises of, for example, inequality as well, is exploitation, what I call the exploitation mindset. And that's basically a, a widespread, but wrong, I would argue, way of thinking that believes that some humans are superior to other humans, so it denies the equal worth of every person, and believes that humans in general are superior to nature, and therefore leads to exploitation both between people within communities or within societies and between people and nature. So one fundamental shift at, at the deepest level where we start thinking about paradigms and mindsets is shifting from this expectation or mindset of exploitation to one of regeneration. Regeneration is all about making things better and achieving their highest purpose. And to do that, we need to do three things. We need to center respect and protection and care for people and nature in everything we do. Both of those simultaneously have to be prioritized. We need to stop harm at the source. So trace problems back to their root causes and address those as thoroughly as possible rather than treating the symptoms. And we need to build resilience. This is the ability to survive and even thrive through change. And it's how we can uh, handle the difficult situations that we find ourselves in and help each other through tough times, both human and uh, natural systems able to cope with change. So how do we do that? Well, I've become convinced that a really underused but essential tool is our feelings. And I think that not addressing or acknowledging or being aware of these feelings is actually a major impediment to climate action. So I spend quite a bit of time on this in the book. I write about my own grief at experiencing the loss of beloved places and systems. The beach where I grew up uh, going as a kid, there's a, an abalone shell on the shelf here behind me that I found on the beach as a child. And that's an example of a species that's not there anymore due to warming oceans, overfishing, pollution, and other human stresses. So we all are living through a time of great change and we all are experiencing loss or damage to people and places that we love. And I think tuning into the strength of these feelings can really help us and guide us in finding where we can engage and what is most important to us to protect and, uh, and engage with and, and the communities where we can be of greatest service. So I advocate for something that I call radical climate acceptance. And what I mean by this is viewing reality as it is without distortion and without judgments and therefore be able to change what we can and accept what we can't. And this is an ongoing struggle. I love the way that um, the, the civil rights activist and justice activist, Audie Barker writes about this. You've probably heard the phrase about, you know, give me the, the, the courage to change the things I can, the wisdom to know the difference uh, and the grace to accept what I can't change. Sorry, I mangled that quote, but hopefully you recognize it. Um, he writes about how, you know, the challenge is in struggling for justice, whether climate justice or, or otherwise, the challenge is that we're motivated by not accepting uh, what is wrong, by recognizing injustice, by wanting to right wrongs, by wanting to make the world a better place. But we don't know what it is that we can fix or the power that we can have until we try. So it's this balance of putting our work into practice while also being able to recognize you know, the limits of our abilities, but to give our greatest and to do the most that we possibly can. So I outline five stages to radical climate acceptance, which are ignorance, avoidance, doom, all the feels, and purpose. And the point of this, what I'm trying to get to, is sometimes called meaning-focused coping. It's a way of dealing with difficult situations where you can acknowledge and face difficult truths and align your actions with your values guided by your feelings in a way that helps you find purpose and meaning. So I, I think that's our challenge. That's fundamentally what we need to do in the climate crisis to be 
useful to be able to cope with the difficulties and to be able to find where we belong and where we can make a contribution. So we all start somehow in ignorance. We have to learn about the facts and relevant news and the evidence for what we can do. Many of us then get stuck for a long time, and I've spent a lot of time myself in stage two, avoidance. I think that's because we are more uncomfortable with the idea of facing some difficult facts than with the idea of pretending those facts don't exist. But at some point we might run into an experience or read something or have a conversation that we no longer feel we can avoid climate change. We can't pretend it's not happening. Even if we would, aren't outright denying the facts of climate change, we might be living as though those, those facts are not a reality. Many people, when they first face these facts, feel or describe a feeling of doom. This is doom scrolling is one example, going down a rabbit hole of the internet, reading a lot of scary news and uh, opinion pieces and freaking out and feeling paralyzed. What I want to say is that there is a way out. So that is not the end. That is a, a stage that we need to help each other get through and not leave anyone behind there. But the way out is through. It is through facing difficult feelings. So acknowledging we are losing, or maybe we haven't even, we have even lost things and places that we care about. That can be motivation both to honor what we have lost and fight for what still remains, which is a lot. Uh, we can be angry at injustice, at the unfair ways in which the impacts of the climate crisis most affect the people who've done the least to cause it, young people, poor people, people in marginalized and vulnerable communities. So tapping into these feelings, I think, is a really powerful engine for motivating action. And when we get to the final stage here of purpose, we are able to uh, honor and acknowledge our deepest values and align our actions with them. And that feels really good. That is where you're in the zone, where you feel motivated, where you find joy and meaning and purpose, where you're able to appreciate what, you're, what you can do, where you help others do their best, and where you are in this phase of meaning-focused coping and otherwise doing your best and, and using basically the climate crisis as a crucible to create meaning and help you contribute your purpose. So I have some more, many more thoughts about that and more thoughts about how to do it, but I want to give you some really concrete actions. So I'm going to spend the rest of my time here today talking about actions of answering uh, at least in a quick way and giving you resources for where you can get deeper actions or deeper answers to the question of what can I do? Most people, it might not feel like this, but most Americans are already concerned or alarmed about climate change. Most Americans are worried about climate change. Most Americans support doing something about climate change. But most Americans are not doing anything themselves about climate change, despite their concern and their worry. And I think one reason is that people, uh, I mean, there are many reasons, but one reason is that people don't know what the most effective and high impact actions are that you can actually take. And if people did take these actions, even a small fraction of people, it doesn't even have to be a majority, the effect would be truly transformative. So I hope some of these actions speak to you and you will find a way of incorporating them in your daily life. It's January right now, the, close to the season of resolutions. I don't know if people made resolutions, um, but it doesn't have to be a resolution for New Year's. I would love you to start this resolution as soon as you can, anytime you hear this. And that is to devote two hours per week, which is 20 minutes a day, six days a week. You get Sundays off uh, or whatever day, one day a week off to high impact climate actions. And I'm going to highlight for you what high impact climate actions are in five different areas of your life. So I don't have the power to create time. We all have the limited number of hours in a day. We all have other things that need to be doing uh, that need to get done. So part of doing this is looking at where you're spending your time now and identifying 20 minutes that are not serving you well, that don't fulfill you, that don't actually 
give you more joy and energy that don't make you happy. So you can stop doing those or shift things you're already doing to a direction where they're con- you're doing what you are already doing and you're also contributing to high impact climate action. That could be at work, for example. So I'll describe, as I said, five roles for you now, and I want you to you know, be thinking about which one resonates the best for me right now, which one do I feel best positioned to engage with. Write down and note the high impact actions there and start spending 20 minutes a day trying to put them into practice. If you get all the way through them, great. Take your next favorite of the five high impact areas or help others to get on board with what you're doing. Um, So let me take you through what that looks like. I can say for myself, what I stopped doing last year, um, I set a limit on my phone for social media apps of 30 minutes a day and zero minutes on Sunday. And that actually enabled me to read 100 books last year. So I realized I was spending a lot, way too much time on social media and I feel much happier having done that. Okay, so I've taken these five roles from a recent study that colleagues and I published a couple months ago. We looked at the evidence for how is it that we can have an impact, that individuals can have an impact both personally and collectively on climate change, on reducing emissions and actually making the changes we need to to stop global warming. What we found were evidence for these five roles here in the middle, consumer, investor, role model as a part of organizations like work or school and as citizens. So I'll take you through the evidence for each of these roles and summarize what we found and what other colleagues have found are actually effective in each of these five areas. Uh, If you want more information about this, I've written about this with um, Christian Stinson Nielsen, who was the lead author of that uh, Nature Energy paper. I also wrote about it in my climate newsletter in October. Um, So those are available if you wanna get references and links and, and more details, but I'll dive in. And I should say that especially we focused on uh, roles that are effective for the top 10% of emitters. A quick test, the basic cutoff for this is if you earn more than $28,000 a year, you are in this group. So that includes me, I'm I'm certainly in this group. Uh, Most people at universities probably fit in this group. And I think one really underused um, piece of climate action is engaging this group. As I said, this group has so much more power than you realize or use. And starting to engage that power by taking these high impact actions in your 20 minutes a day really can make a critical difference. Okay, so what does that look like? When we talk about the consumer role, this is how you spend your money and time and what kind of emissions you produce basically from your lifestyle. So a number of studies have shown the biggest um, sources of emissions here are travel, primarily air travel and secondarily driving cars and housing. So let's look a little more at that. Right now, the world is quite unequal and very unfair. It's only about a billion people worldwide who enjoy a standard of living that might be easy to take for granted in places like Sweden or Oregon. So that's the the people living on what Hans Rosling and colleagues call level four here on the right. Um, You see that for us, water comes from a tap. We don't have to think about collecting or, or purifying it in order to drink and cook with it. We have uh, grocery stores where we can buy a range of healthy and nutritious foods, as well as some, you know, maybe less healthy choices. Um, Cars are widespread or even ubiquitous. But you see that most people on Earth live in what's considered the global middle class. Those are people living on what Hans Rosling calls level two and level three. So somewhere between two and $32 uh, per person per day. So those are... um, people who don't have nearly the access to the resources that we do in the lifestyles that we take for granted. And in particular, who don't have the same kind of uh, nutrition, the same kind of physical security, the same transportation, and consequently their emissions are much, much lower. And then there are about a billion people who live in extreme poverty. And the first of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which all the governments of the world have signed off on and agreed to, and 
are behind schedule putting into practice, but the universally agreed first goal is eliminate poverty and focus on eliminating extreme poverty. It's a tragedy that there are people who don't have money for shoes who uh, cook over open fires, which is bad for their health and bad for the environment. Who often women and girls are responsible for collecting water uh, that might be quite distant and difficult to get. So basically the challenge as you see here, is for high emitters, uh, which includes myself in this top 10% income, we need to reduce our personal emissions. We are way over our budget. If you're in this top 10% earning about $28,000 or more, you're likely about 10 times over the budget. That's sustainable to be on track to limit warming. That's around two tons per person in the next 90 months. So if you're somewhere over 20, you need to get to around two. That's a big cut in the next less than a decade. If you're lucky enough to be a top 1% income earner, that means you earn about $109,000 a year or more. Your personal carbon footprint is somewhere 50 to 70 tons per person. So you're somewhere like 30 or more times over the budget. And personal cuts are really essential for that group. We simply will not stop climate change without those of us in this top 10% reducing our overconsumption. At the same time, we need to make system changes so that all energy, all transportation, all the things that we need and use and the services that we need and use are fossil free. So making those system changes for this middle 40% who are uh, over the, the current limit, but not by a huge amount. And especially for this bottom 50% who have room to about triple their emissions. I mean, if you don't have shoes, uh, you're not producing a lot of emissions. So it's a, it's a balancing act basically of reducing overconsumption while actually providing more material goods and services to the poorest who lack the basic infrastructure and services for a good life and achieving their capacity. If we break this down by household, so we're getting to the high impact action here. This is based on the household data for Europe. It's similar for North America. For high income earners, and especially for the highest income group, the majority of our emissions come from travel. So almost half of, uh, or about 40% of the highest income uh, households emissions come from flying in planes. Whereas you see that there is essentially you almost have to be in the top 10 percent to ev even in europe uh, or um, even in europe to fly in planes to begin with so uh, many of us might take flying for granted and see it as this normal everyday practice it is actually globally really rare uh, most people on earth have never been in a plane and one percent of people on earth who are frequent flyers cause half of emissions from climate change, from aviation. So it's a very luxury and unevenly distributed practice. So if we are going to reduce our high emissions and we are high emitters ourselves, the first thing to do is to cut flights because that is, if you fly, that's the largest share of your carbon footprint. The next thing to do is to reduce driving because that's the second largest part of the average carbon footprint. The third thing that we found, and I think this is in, or in the, the next study, is to actually switch to a plant-based diet. So those are the three high-impact climate actions that consistently, uh, across a range of studies, consistently reduced emissions. And at the same time, we've got to make these transitions at the society level so that everybody can meet their needs in a carbon-free way. But those technological changes, switching from burning fossil fuels to renewable energy, for example, uh, electrifying everything to run on energy and making all energy clean and renewable, that actually won't be enough to stop climate change if we still have overconsumption. So we've got to do both at the same time. This is a nice visualization uh, from a study that Seth Wines and I published in 2017. It was recently um, featured in Information is Beautiful, uh, one of my favorite data visualization gurus. So uh, they made a really nice graphic here. But basically you see that the high impact climate actions for each flight that you skip, um, it's worth about eight months of driving the average car. So, or two years of eating meat, for example. So reducing flights is a really high impact climate action. 
going car free is also very high impact. Um, I know that's difficult in some parts of the US, although in Eugene, I know you have wonderful bike and uh, um, more accessible infrastructure. But what any car trips that you can skip make a really big difference. And switching to a plant based diet is also a really high impact climate action. So if you're focused on high impact actions within uh, the consumption domain, going flight car and meat free, picking the one starting with what's easiest, what seems most accessible, uh, maybe having a goal of cutting in half to start if it doesn't seem possible to go without, those are great ways to get started. And I've uh, done these things myself. So I've gone from being a frequent flyer to reducing my flying about 95%. I've gone car free, which is certainly easier now that I live in Europe than it was in California. Um, but I've also taken the train across North America for a wedding trip, including a stop in Eugene, which we really enjoyed um, and gone meat free in my diet as well. If we're making it really practical, here's a guidance from uh, the Harvard Planetary Health Plate on what a healthy and sustainable diet looks like. So what you're aiming for at, at most meals is to have about half of your plate covered in fruits and vegetables, no more than uh, dairy products and about one glass of milk per day, or equivalently a piece of cheese about the size of your thumb, no more than a couple of eggs and a couple of servings of fish and chicken per week, and at most a couple of burgers per month. That's the level of animal product that fit within a healthy and sustainable diet if you're not cutting meat entirely. Okay, what about as an investor? Well, we might think of investor and think of Warren Buffett. Um, that might not be many of us on this call, but many of us might have investments in pension funds, for example, or portfolios or have uh, made investments over time. And you can look at this fossil free funds calculator to see what the carbon footprint of those investments is. And when I did this a few years ago, I was really shocked and disappointed that several of the uh, mutual funds that I owned actually had a heavy investment in fossil fuels. So I've since divested from them, uh, invested in um, a carbon free fund and been able to do that with, you know, my financial advisor. So uh, we're also starting to get evidence that there's potentially a better return from fossil free investments. Um, essentially, we're going to, if we actually are going to solve climate change, we're going to very soon hit a point where we recognize that fossil investments are not a valuable resource, they're actually a dangerous liability. And when that happens, and it is starting to happen, uh, those funds are not a wise place to have your money. So I think there's both a, a moral case, a climate case, and really a financial case to make this personal divestment happen. Institutional divestment is also a really powerful tool. And uh, students at Harvard recently had a big victory after a decade of campaigning. So the original students who started the campaign were no longer there to see their victory, although I'm sure they also celebrated that uh, Harvard has now made a commitment to take its money out of fossil fuel investments. I don't actually know where the University of Oregon stands on that, but I think it's really worth uh, being clear with the universities that you're a part of, that you're where you're an alumni or a student, um, in particular, that you make your financial support of such universities contingent on them living up to their values and not supporting fossil fuels with their investments. Another thing you can do is break up with your mega bank. Um, I wrote about this in my newsletter over the summer, so for more details, you can look there, but basically, uh, I used to have Bank of America, for example. Um, if your bank is a major national name like Chase or Wells Fargo or th these big banks, they are supporting fossil fuels. They are still continuing to invest in and fund fossil fuel expansion and infrastructure that is not compatible with the Paris Agreement, that is not compatible with limiting climate change. So I was very happy to take my money out of Bank of America to write them a letter explaining why, which I've also shared and you're welcome to use, and to move my money to a credit union, which is basically a locally based and not-for-profit organization that does not support fossil fuels. 
Um, we've talked about your pension fund. It's worth looking into there. There are many organized campaigns for I know here in Sweden and elsewhere that are pushing for um, divesting pensions. So that's a really valuable activity at work or you know through your union or through your organization um, where your pension is based. And support those campaigns. And another way of being a powerful high impact climate investor is to donate 10% of your income or as much as you can afford to climate charities. Right now, less than 10% of Americans actually donate money to any sort of climate cause. So there's a huge gap. I told you that the majority of Americans are concerned or alarmed. Something like 72% are worried, but something like 10% are actually investing any money in the groups that are working the hardest to address and solve the problem. So closing that gap and actually making a monthly donation or a recurring or one-time donation to organizations that are working uh, to stop climate change is a really powerful way to tr connect your personal actions at the system scale. Okay, we've talked about consumers as investors. We also have really powerful roles to play as role models. And the bigger your platform, the, the more people you interact with, the bigger effect potentially you can have here. But this isn't just for, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio or celebrities with millions of Twitter or Instagram followers, because all of us have communities that we're a part of. All of us are influenced by the people around us. And we know from research that actually the people who we are most influenced by and who we have the biggest potential to influence are those in our daily lives. They're the people we work with every day. They're the people in our families, our neighbors. We can really play a big role there. And when we talk about role modeling, I think a, a really clear example is thinking about our use of social media. Um, if earlier last year, Emily Atkin, who writes uh, the heated newsletter, talked about meat posting, which is a term that she invented saying, uh, basically, you know, if you're posting about, here's my grilled steak on the barbecue, here's, you know, my salami um, uh, lunch meat or whatever, you're basically doing free public relations for a very polluting activity and in industry. So I think this is really worth thinking about what are the things that we put on our holiday cards that we post on social media that we share? Is it something on an exotic beach that took many, many tons of carbon, many years of a sustainable carbon budget that we are glorifying and helping to um, give status to? And how could we do that differently? I wrote about that in my December newsletter, basically, what would a climate friendly um, holiday card look like? That's a, a big platform that many people have and might not be thinking about, you know, what are the climate messages we're sending? How could we make that a piece of climate action? So basically, through role modeling, what's high impact is taking those um, high impact personal actions and making them more public. If we're talking about flying, pledge to stay on the ground. There are flight free campaigns in dozens of countries. We have a project studying the movement that started here in Sweden, but there's also one in the US. Um, when I took this journey, I was inspired by colleagues, fellow climate scientists who had stopped flying or stopped, begun flying less. And in 2012, I basically let my gold card that you can see here um, expire. It's now in a museum, which is where it belongs. So it's in a museum called Carbon Ruins, which is looking back at the concluded fossil age and all the bizarre things that, you know, once we've actually made this transition successfully and now it's 2053, the world has gone fossil free. According to this vision, Sweden was the first fossil free welfare state as we've stated that we want to be. Look at all these crazy things we used to do like reward this highly polluting activity. So that has been an important part of my journey. Finding ways to commute without using a car, uh, to work remotely under better conditions than many of us currently find ourselves, um, but to be able to make delicious meals out of plant-based foods and share those recipes, to think consciously about how we're using social media uh, and use it to encourage the low carbon high life and to talk about climate change, to find opportunities to open doors, to listen and engage with curiosity, um, to draw people into conversation, to create art and music and literature, 
and whatever it is that we're doing that can connect to climate change and open those conversations. That's how we can be a role model. We all are connected to some kinds of organizations, whether it's work or school organizations that we have historically been a part of where we're alumni. Um, and here we can have a really powerful contribution. So I just want to highlight a couple of resources for you that are in service of this idea that I think is really important that we need to make all jobs climate jobs. You don't need to quit whatever job you have now and run away and join the climate circus or you know become a full-time climate activist if you feel called to do that please feel welcome but you also have a really powerful role to play in the current industry with the current skills that you have because basically we need every industry to become climate friendly to stop using fossil fuels to make their supply chains compatible with a stable climate so wherever you are in your career, wherever you find yourself working, there are ways to make your job a climate job. And these two resources, have, one is called Climate Solutions at Work. It's a report by Project Drawdown, and it really breaks down and goes through in some detail. What does it mean if you're in procurement? How do you make that a climate job? What if you're in HR? What if you're in law? You know, what are the opportunities? How can you use the skills you already have to help guide your industry and your business uh, toward, or your organization towards being part of climate solutions. If you are in the corporate world, uh, I recommend you check out Science-Based Targets Initiative. That is the most rigorous and most uh, empirically supported uh, project that I'm aware of that actually lets businesses and guides them through how to reduce emissions in line with what the science demands to actually meet uh, the Paris Agreement goals and stabilize climate. So these are things like joining the science-based targets, divesting your industry or your business from fossil fuels, making your supply chain fossil-free, setting strong industry standards. These are some of the ways you can make your job a climate job. And finally, the last high impact role or climate superpower that you have is as a citizen. And this is where through participating in the democracy that we have and need to uphold and renew uh, through social movements, through lobbying and um, connecting with our elected representatives, we can have influence on public policy and on governments. And here I'm summarizing from a number of sources, especially a book by um, Seth Wines, my former student, which I really recommend. It's a very well-written and, and easily digestible evidence-based guide to how to take high impact climate actions across a range of domains. Um, what Seth finds and corroborated by other evidence, voting is really important. Uh, two different studies showed that voting for women has been shown to lower emissions and voting for politicians with good climate scores. You can look at the League of Conservation Voters and their grades basically for how politicians have voted and what that's meant for the climate. Getting active with your time and money and energy and creativity in political parties or in climate organizations is a way to carry your voice and raise it together with others and make it go further. Creating media attention is effective. That can be writing a letter to the editor or an op-ed um, or demonstrations that gain media attention through creative, nonviolent, engaging um, uh, manifestations. And finally, one that's really important and really underused is writing or calling your representatives. So writing a physical letter, uh, not a chain email, or picking up the phone and calling them. Studies have shown consistently this is really effective and extremely underused. Politicians hear a lot from lobbyists who are interested in maintaining the status quo and continuing fossil fuel use. They do not hear enough from constituents saying, look, I'm concerned about this issue. I care about climate change. I want you to take bold action. I'll support you in making this happen. Um, they need to hear much more from their constituents to basically give them the political motivation to take bold climate policy. Okay, so you've got your action plan. Uh, I hope that you feel ready. So to remind you, you want to, to I will ask you to think about what can you stop doing or shift doing 
to make time for climate action? How can you make this not another thing on your to-do list, but actually a way of allocating your time more in line with your values? And which of the five roles called out to you? Which, where do you think you can personally make a difference in starting? Which feels the, the most appealing or the easiest to start with? If it's at your role as a consumer, the high impact actions are to go flight, car, and meat free. If you're looking for a, a New Year's resolution or something to make a lifestyle change, reducing your flying, driving, and meat consumption are a great place to start. If it's as an investor, the high impact actions are banking and investing green, divesting your existing investments from companies that are supporting fossil fuel expansion and deforestation, making donations to organizations that are fighting for climate justice and climate solutions. If it's as a role model, it's leading by example through these other four roles and talking about it, engaging people in conversation, making um, a model that others can follow and understanding where others are coming from and creating space for them to make their own path. If it's as your role in an organization, it's how can you make your job a climate job? What are the skills that you bring to the table and how can you use them for climate solutions? And if it's as a citizen, it's about voting, volunteering, joining organizations, getting media attention, writing and calling your rep. So I hope this has been a helpful whirlwind tour of the facts, feelings and actions for climate change. This is my mission. This is what I'm doing all the time. This is what my free monthly newsletter is about. It's the topic of my book, Under the Sky We Make. Um, so I hope if you'd like to hear more, you'll consider signing up for the newsletter reading more about it in the book. Feel those, the newsletter is the best way to reach me and to stay in touch. Um, but I really appreciate seeing this great audience here today. So many people interested in and concerned about and wanting to take climate action. So I hope I've given you some good places to start. And with that, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kim, for that uh, informative and pragmatic talk. Um, as I've said before, if you'd like to ask questions, just type them into the chat. A couple have already come in. The first thing I wanted to share is that Steve Mittal, who is the director of the U of O's Office of Sustainability, explains that UO has committed to divest from fossil fuels. The last time he checked, fossil fuel investments were less than 1%. There are some long-term contracts uh, that have yet to expire since the commitment was made. So that's an interesting fact for everyone to know. Um, but let's move to the questions. The first is, what's your take on compensating for carbon emissions, like from flying, donating to climate reducing projects? Some airlines seem to be offering that now, um, but we don't get a, a great sense of awareness or acceptance about those offers. What's your opinion about those kinds of efforts? So I actually don't support carbon offsets. I think that they in practice haven't been shown to work. Um, the study that I cite in the book found that only 2% of projects that were supported across a, a large range of carbon offset projects were actually additional, meaning they removed carbon or prevented carbon from being emitted and actually reduced carbon elsewhere. So. One reason I don't support offsets is that I think they're ineffective. The evidence shows that they are ineffective. Another reason is that I think they are uh, ethically problematic, that the idea that I can do something bad and pay someone else to make up for it really doesn't work, especially when we're talking about luxury activities like flying, where I don't think there's a good justification to say, poor people who are already three times under their carbon budget can somehow reduce their emissions more. And it's okay for me to continue to emit 30 times or more than my fare limit, I think is really a problem. So I don't support carbon offsets. What I do support, as I mentioned, is don't reducing your own emissions as much as you possibly can. And when you've done that, because we do still live in a world that largely runs on fossil fuels, there probably will be times where you fill up a car with gas or you end up buying a plane ticket. And when you do that, I my suggestion is that you donate an equal amount of money as you spend on filling your car or on that plane ticket to a climate organization. 
and I don't consider that an offset. It doesn't undo the harm that you've done by burning those fossil fuels because that carbon will stay in the atmosphere forever. But you are acknowledging that harm. You're trying to reduce it at its source as much as possible. And you're then trying to make a system change and uh, help create a better world. So you can either use that money um, to reduce your own emissions elsewhere, for example, to save up for a heat pump uh, to replace a propane heater or to donate to a charity that's working towards systemic change. So that's what I do and I, what I recommend. So a couple of questions about travel. They're uh, interesting and challenging questions. So the first, um, uh, one of our questioners has an eight hour drive back home from U of O, but could also drive about 20 minutes to the airport and take a plane. Given that this questioner does this multiple times per year, what would you suggest is the more environmentally friendly option? I mean, you can look at a carbon calculator to help you figure that out for that specific case. Um, I suffered from analysis paralysis for about a year where I was trying to figure out the answer to questions like that. And what I and what ended up working for me was making a decision to stop flying within Europe. Um, so that's the continent where I live. And that basically led to broader system changes where I said, OK, that means I'm not going to go somewhere far away for a one hour meeting. I need to make my travel really count. I need to make the most of a, a trip I'm going to take and combine, you know, it will take me some time to get there. So I want to have time to relax and sightsee or visit friends along the way. I need to only accept invitations that I feel I can make a, a big and important difference or where my presence is really important. And I guess that's what I would recommend is trying to make um, a pledge. I mean, the, we know that the biggest emissions reduction you could make, given that you have a big distance between where you live and where you need to be, would be to make that trip less often by whatever means. And uh, hopefully under better circumstances than right now where that might be enforced on us by the pandemic. Um, so reducing that trip in the first place, so taking fewer longer trips uh, and considering if it's possible to live closer to work. I used to live really far from school. So when I was doing my PhD at Stanford, I was living in Sonoma, which is almost a two hour drive away. So I was kind of locked into a very high carbon footprint then where I spent many, many hours a day in the cars. I would often eat two meals a day in the car and I had reasons for living where I did and going to school where I did. But I think in general, trying to plan uh, as much as possible to live near where we need to be for work or family or other reasons um, is the best that we can do. Uh, so the next question is another uh, travel question. Um, international travel is integral to our economy, political mm -hmm. institutions, and our own lives. Would international travel by, be, um, uh, by maritime travel be a plausible alternative? And what possible considerations should we think about uh, with an increase in maritime travel internationally? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. I mean, here's where coming back to the humanities, I think climate fiction can give us lots of ideas. If you read one of my favorite authors uh, in this space is Kim Stanley Robinson. And he, that man loves him an airship. So in all of his novels, uh, there are airships that travel um, internationally. He also envisions a world where, um, because physics is just not on the side of uh, jet travel, unfortunately, in the age of climate change, um, a lot more travel would be by uh, ships, which are easier to make carbon free. So I do think that is a really positive step and way forward. Um, my husband and I have a goal of sailing across the Atlantic at some point. I mean, the only I mentioned, so I've cut my flying 95%. The only flights I haven't yet given up are um, maximum of one a year back going back to North America from where I now live far away from family to see my family. So I think I'm definitely familiar with these struggles and dilemmas. And I think, you know, in 2010, when I was applying for faculty jobs, having recently completed my PhD, I was 
applying all over the world and not thinking about the climate footprint of my choices. I think if I were making that decision now, I wouldn't be applying somewhere so far away from home that necessitates a long and carbon intensive trip, kind of almost whatever uh, way that I go now. But, you know, we have to live in the world we are in now as we work towards a better one. So I understand uh, these struggles. And I think, you know, finding ways for me, something that was really important was being willing to do what I could without um, feeling that it, I couldn't do everything. So it wasn't worth doing anything. I think because I had thought, OK, I can't imagine giving up flying to see my family. That means I can't imagine giving up any of the 15 flights a year I took in 2010, for example. I realized, OK, that actually doesn't make sense. There are flights that aren't necessary for me. I could still be a productive researcher and have collaborations and travel and have exchange without flying within Europe. and. Uh, focusing my my collaborations more locally and saving my one flight a year for North America. So I do think there are ways to rethink what we get from travel, the benefits we get from travel and make the most of them and to realize that travel is not the same as flying and there are ways to travel that don't involve flying and those are going to be better for the climate. So the next question is from a colleague in the art history department who is an environmental art historian, Emily Scott, and she asks um, about your your personal experience working on climate change based in Sweden versus in the US, including in terms of uh, the feelings aspect. Emily read years ago that the climate scientist Jason, Jason Box framed his own move to Sweden from the US as him being a climate refugee because he felt you, the US context was so toxic, uh, um, contentious, grief producing that he needed to escape. Any thoughts on that? I'm writing down that name because I want to read more about that. I haven't come across Jason Box's work. Um, I'm very interested to read more about it. I mean, that wasn't my own motivation um, in taking this job. I applied for, my motivation was I wanted to be a professor. I applied for 66 jobs over three years, and this is the one that I got. So it was a little more pragmatic. Um, but I can certainly relate to that, you know, retrospectively looking back on my experience that um, I think it is tough to have your eyes open about climate change in the US right now. Um, there's just such a huge gap between what's needed and the leadership that is that we have. Um, and I think that is really tough. And I mean, I'm definitely inspired by people who see that challenge and see it as a invitation and demand to rise up and create their own solutions to make their own contributions and that there's just such a huge need but i do also agree that it is a really tough environment and i think it can be hard to to be in that environment so yeah i um feel also grateful that i've landed in sweden but i also have a lot of love and concern and care for my family and friends in the places I grew up back in the US. So I can see having a foot in both worlds. Uh, so Steve Mattal uh, shares, uh, locally, the biggest and often most practical emissions reductions actions households can take are one switch to electric heat pump and get an electric car. But we have a, a related question. I'm concerned about the push that we all buy new EV cars. This seems extremely problematic for us to push to build new cars rather than uh, convert our current cars to EV. The best car is no car. So if you can go car free, that is definitely the best. I mean, with current technology, um, the life cycle estimates are that it's about 50% better to get an electric car, a new electric car, than to continue driving an old gas car. Um, I haven't seen studies on what the emissions impacts would be to convert existing cars to electric. So I'm, I'm not aware of that as a possibility, but it sounds intriguing. In general, sometimes the advice for cars is a little bit um, counterintuitive because a general rule of thumb is the most sustainable things to have and use are the things you already have. So avoiding buying new stuff. That's definitely the case, for example, for clothing or for um, durable goods. Or, But if it's something that directly burns fossil fuels or directly uses electricity, like 
cars burning fossil fuels or um, appliances like fridges and dishwashers. If you have a really old one and a really inefficient one, it can be better to get a new one that's efficient because most of its emissions and impacts come from use rather than production. So it's an interesting point. I'll look and see if I can find any studies on, on doing that. But I mean, in general, reducing your car mileage as much as possible, getting more people in any car that you're in. So carpooling, um, substituting cars as much as possible. I mean, if you don't wanna buy an electric car, buy your family electric bikes. <laughs> that is way better, like 20 times better or, or even more than any trip you can substitute. An electric bike with a car is a huge win. So the next question uh, is about the role that fear plays in our current climate crisis. Not only the fear of the crisis itself, which is presumably related to climate change denial, but fear as an underlying motivator for creating systems and stories of exploitation in the first place. If fear is central in the creation and perpetuation of these systems, and also for our continued failure to adequately address our climate crisis, do you have any thoughts about forms of shared practice interaction and uh, uh, engagement that can support people in facing, moving toward, and being with, rather than fleeing from their fears of loss, loss, death, impermanence, and uncertainty? Oh, I love that question. Let's see. I mean, I think one thing that, hap that I spent way too much time on on climate Twitter, and I'm kind of on a Twitter break at the moment and enjoying it very much, um, there's so much debate on what is the right way to message each and every situation and each and every emotion? And I think it's really important to know what the research shows, and there are some robust trends. Climate Outreach is an organization in the UK that's done a lot of really helpful research on what messages generally resonate both visually and in text. Um, the Yale Center for Climate Communication is another that has really good best practices. But that said, I think it's important not to oversimplify emotions, if, you know, and this certainly wasn't what the, the questioner was saying, but sometimes you hear claims like fear is bad. Fear-based messaging is bad. And I'm not advocating fear. I'm not advocating needlessly scaring people, but I think we have to recognize that different messages and different emotions work for different people in different ways. So, I mean, there is some evidence that people who have actually changed behavior, this is work by Swedish colleagues, uh, Nina Worms and Maria um, Soderoth, um, people who have actually changed behavior, fear was a motivator for them in making large behavior changes like uh, going flight free and reducing their flying. So I think it is really important to be able to face fears. And as the questioner mentioned, and I guess, I mean, those are psychological skills of learning to tolerate discomfort and uncertainty. And I mean, I think the questioner also mentioned mortality and these big um, existential issues. I mean, there, I think the humanities probably has a lot to teach us. I can also recommend a resource, um, which is a newsletter and a forthcoming book, Gen Dread, Generation Dread by Dr. Britt Ray. Um, she works with climate emotions in particular. Um, and I think has a lot of really smart things to say. And finally, I can say I wrote about fear, uh, climate fear, I think in the November issue of my newsletter. And there's a PhD student in Norway who's studying climate fear who basically had a great quote that I put in there it was something like, I'm not afraid of climate fear. Or like, yeah, there's nothing in the literature to say that fear is bad. So um, I think it's it's worth diving into, you know, what does the evidence say about different emotions? But also, I mean, the most important, I think, is if we're talking about our own experience, our own communication to be genuine and authentic to how we actually feel. So not trying to manufacture artificial emotions in others, but to, you know, I mean, I, to be straightforward, like I've written um, about being afraid of, of climate impacts about, you know, when my sister called me and told me she was evacuating her house because the wildfire perimeter had reached the center of town where she lived, I was, fear was gripping my stomach. And I think it's important that we create space to have those conversations, to talk about those difficult emotions and help people find healthy ways to process and cope with them so that we can actually have healthy and, and meaning-based responses. So I've got a couple of questions that are related and I'll just sort of compress them 
Two common criticisms to individual-based solutions are that they miss the real reasons for climate change. First, shifting the focus from uh, the small number of big polluting corporations that make up a whole chunk of the emissions and put guilt on us consumers. And second, uh, that approach is blind to the main problem of the capitalist system that is the root cause of the problem. So the criticisms are that individual-based solutions do not go to the jugular of the problem. Uh, and the related question is um, a lot of uh, recent messaging from climate activists that individual reductions are relatively inconsequential relative to corporate actions. How do you answer those criticisms? How do you respond to those points? Yeah, I'm really glad you raised that because it's something I hear a lot. On the So the first point is about do individual actions matter? Are they effective? And the answer is definitely yes. So that doesn't negate or that doesn't mean that do corporate actions matter? The answer is unambiguously yes. And basically to solve climate change, we're going to need governments, businesses, and individuals and civil society to do what's necessary in the very limited time remaining. So I think the way I try to think about it that I find the most helpful is to have a yes and framing rather than a no but. I think by acknowledging the fact that many of us, including myself, have historically been part of this group of over consumers who are using more than our fair share of fossil fuel based resources and directly contributing to the problem. That doesn't let Shell and BP off the hook. If you want, you know, read my newsletter. I'm not going easy on those guys. Um, I'm very clear and very aware of this history of misinformation that many of the large oil companies have uh, have produced and the continued foot dragging and less and less outright denial of scientific fact, but, you know, very clear delay and um, procrastination and basically predatory delay is what Alex Steffen calls it, of trying to put off the inevitable of actually stopping using fossil fuels. So, I mean, that's why I emphasize we have to stop both the production, which is the company's job, and the consumption, which is our job as high consumers, if you are a high consumer. I think it's really important and often overlooked. If you're not a high consumer, then your personal actions don't matter. But most of the people saying uh, that are actually high consumers. So in other words, if your personal footprint is at or below the average for your country, then I agree that it's not effective or important for you to focus a lot of effort on reducing your emissions, because basically you're not an over consumer. You're living within the average for your country and system change will be the most important. But if you're someone who's flown on a plane, uh, especially if you do that regularly, you are an over consumer and your personal actions do really matter. And we have really clear evidence for that. The second part, how can we fix climate change um, within capitalism? I think, um, I mean, it's clear that climate change exacerbates inequality. We have data from Marshall Burke and colleagues at Stanford showing that climate change to date, already existing climate change, has increased income inequality by about 25%. So rich countries have gotten richer and poor countries have gotten poorer than they otherwise would have uh, due to the effects of climate change. And that's primarily because poor countries happen to be uh, located around the equator and tend to be already quite warm. And so further warming there tends to reduce, for example, labor productivity um, and other economic indicators. Guess what? Capitalism also increases income inequality. So these two things right now are reinforcing and um, exacerbating each other. I don't have all the answers for how do we fix capitalism or is there a better alternative to capitalism and can we replace capitalism with something better? But I think it's pretty clear that we need a financial and economic system that puts the well being of people at the center, that doesn't fetishize economic growth in and of itself for the sake of economic growth, but rather prioritizes human well-being and human thriving and uh, intact and healthy nature as the measures of a life well lived in a society that's working and addressing both uh, 
leaving fossil fuels in the ground and reducing income inequalities is going to be really important to make that work. So um, one of the questioners is wondering about a role that is not on your list, and that's the role of homeowner. How do investments in insulation, solar panels, et cetera, compare to, for example, a meat-free diet uh, in, in uh, addressing our personal impact on climate change? Oh, great question. I think, let's see if I can go back quickly um, to give you an est here, estimate. Um, so as homeowners, you have a big role, but here you can see, okay, switch to, you can't see my arrow, but hopefully you can see, I think it's the one, two, three, sixth bar down is switch to a plant-based diet. Um, that saves 0.8 tons per person per year on average. And you see below that um, more efficient home heating, for example, like smart thermostats is substantially lower. It's about four times less. Um, for a really comprehensive answer to that question, you can look at a, a paper by um, Diana Ivanova um, in environmental research letters. It's something like, consumer choices and carbon footprints or something like that. I look at that paper like once a week. Um, sorry, I'm just looking for my blood because I see my battery's low. Hang on one second. Speaking of electronic choices. So the bottom line is home energy use is important. It's a, an important source of emissions. Um, it is tough to give simple evidence-based advice for homeowners that are actually high impact. And that's why I don't do it. So um, I think the most effective ways for uh, making buildings more efficient is through, for example, regulations so that um, all buildings become passive house standard or zero carbon buildings, for example. Um, but the bottom line is, yes, I mean, you can make some, the high impact actions at home are to reduce your energy use as much as possible, switch to clean energy, either from solar panels on your own roof or by buying green energy uh, from a provider. There's been some issues with those, but I think in the US um, that can be pretty reliable, uh, having efficient appliances, heat pumps. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're more of a, a um, smorgasbord that requires actually a lot of, um, expertise and personal investment. And I've found personally as a homeowner in the US quite difficult to implement myself. You really need a contractor. You either need like personal experience and ability to do um, rather advanced electrical work, for example, or you need a contractor who really knows what they're doing and is familiar with it. And that's not the default. So I don't focus on home energy use as a high impact climate action because it's kind of a tough one. So Kim, um, I know now that it's nearly 10.30 p.m. in Sweden. Uh, you've been very generous with your time. I wanna thank um, everyone for joining us uh, to listen to Kimberly Nicholas tell us about her work and about her vision for climate change action. It's been a fascinating talk and conversation. Kim, thank you so much uh, for taking the time and sharing with us. For more information, everyone, on other upcoming events sponsored by the Oregon Humanities Center, or if you'd like to contribute to supporting our public events and research programs, visit ohc.uoregon.edu. Thank you everyone for watching. Thanks again, uh, Kimberly Nicholson. Nicholas. Thank you so much, Paul. And thank you everyone. It was a pleasure to be with you.